in studio. I'm so excited to be with you today and coming into your living rooms, into your kitchens, into your boardrooms. This is fantastic because we have a great lineup. We like to talk with people from the community about what they're doing, uh, what they're seeing, and how they are really shaping the world we now live in. So today, our show is two-part. The first part, we'll be talking with Richard Pelletier about money. That's always a great topic for everyone. I hope everyone. Also, we'll be talking with some fantastic women who are going to really share um, the message about uh, what being a woman means to them and what are some things happening in terms of women and where we're going. So first, I'm gonna start with Richard. And Richard, tell us about money, about investments, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, what we need to think about. No one ever saves enough money when you retire. There, and you really have to start early. And the trick is not to lose money to begin with. That's more difficult than it sounds. I would imagine so. And when you think about it, not to lose it, but how about to really get it? Well, it becomes down to budget. Most people I tell them when you're younger, start off with 5%. Just, you're not gonna miss it after a couple of months, then try to go for 10. But people always pay their bills, and what's left over is what they save. The trick is to reverse that process. Pay yourself first. What's left over, learn to live on it. Exactly, now what are we really doing wrong? Because it's so hard to even do that simple thing. Wall Street does a very effective job of professing the buy and hold philosophy, which is not terribly dangerous when you're working, you have a nice paycheck. But when you retire, which is most of my practice dealing with retirees, and you're still holding those same assets and they take a 20, 30, or 40% drop like they did last time in 2008, and you're drawing out $1,000 a month to live on because Social Security is not enough, those shares are never gonna return. So what happens sooner or later, if you have a downturn in the market in the first three, year, three five, 10 years of your, your retirement, you're gonna run out of money much too early. Okay. And what can we do? What can we do? I tell people when you hear these talking heads on TV, be very careful, who are they talking to? If you're talking to a wage earner and a family has an income that's pretty significant, that may be very good advice. But when you're retired and there's no salary any longer, and Social Security is only going to provide maybe a third of what you need to live on, the same advice may be dangerous. So I tell people to allocate their assets between safe money and money at, at risk in the, in the stock market. And when you say allocate, um, for everybody listening out there, some specific ways that, what would you suggest? Well. When you go into stocks, that's one thing. You're not very diversified. You go into mutual funds, there's a lot of expenses in there that are not all that apparent. No one ever reads a prospectus. God, I can't read my own prospectus. They're driven by lawyers, they're 20 inches thick, and we pick them up, open them up, and throw them in the wastepaper basket. They don't understand how those operate. Uh, when you go into the market, everybody this last few years are enjoying it, it's going up. Mm -hmm. But they forget very quickly what happened in 2008. Even more so, they can't remember what happened in 2001 and 2002. I mean, we lost about 50% of our value in the stock market in those three years. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've got another five or 10 or 15 years to make it up, that's one thing. But if you're not working longer, you're gonna have a problem. Exactly, and especially if you wanna retire and you're trying to really put together a portfolio and a life outlook that's gonna sustain what you want your quality of life to be. I tell people once they retire, you no longer have to be worried about the return on your investment, the ROI. You need to be far more concerned about the reliability of your income. And if that asset can't be relied on to generate a certain amount of income, and it takes a dip, you're going back to work at 72. Exactly. You're, and not, you're not going to be playing on the golf course. You're going to be working on the golf, golf course. course. Exactly. And the biggest thing, and that's the fear that a lot of people won't be able to retire. And how do they speak to their children about how to, to sustain them? Because it might fall on their children. I tell my clients, which are, again, most of them are retired, and some of them are quite elderly, uh, your biggest gift to your children is being independent. And that takes planning, reliability of income, what part of portfolio can be relied on to give income. And of course, the big thing is the unexpected. Uh, the book I wrote years ago, Advising Elders in Crisis, I run a 200-bed nursing home through law school nights at West New England. And no one ever thinks they're gonna land up in a nursing home. But home health care, assisted living facilities, an assisted living facility is, is three, four thousand, five thousand dollars per month. A nursing home is fourteen thousand, and no one, virtually no one, has long-term care insurance. Mm -hmm. How are these assets going to be moved from the sick spouse to the healthy spouse, and help them become eligible for Medicaid assistance? That's a very, very tricky practice. 
And what would you say would be some things that people can do at 40 and 50 that will definitely uh, be put them in a good situation when they want to retire? Long-term care insurance is, is a must. Life insurance can be a very appropriate way to re replenish assets you know, to your spouse when you pass away. Life insurance doesn't stop just because the kids are out of diapers and they're, they're gone on their own. You have a responsibility to your spouse, and it runs two ways. Uh, when you're in your 40s, compounded interest is a wonderful thing. And between the tortoise and the hare, I much prefer the approach of the tortoise. I'm probably a heretic in the investment business. I'd much rather have steady 3, 4, 5% growth year in, year out than shoot for the 15% and lose to 30% the next year. That doesn't make a very smart plan to me. And what can young people do, like 20 and 30 years old? What would be great advice for them in kind of forecasting the future and what it might be for them to retire, you know, 30, 40 years from now? Einstein said one of the most marvels of science is compounded interest. And when you're in your 20s and you're saving just 5% of your income, you're not going to miss it. You will not believe where you'll be in your 50s. And wouldn't you say it'd be great to focus on their income? Because without income, you know, that really drives your experience and what you're going to be able to save. Two sides of that question. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. As you have income, you have expenses. Mm -hmm. And the trouble is to take a look at both. Mm -hmm. uh, do you really need a brand new lease BMW every two years? Mm -hmm. Okay, do you have to have cable TV at $300 a month? I'm old enough, that used to be a mortgage payment. Mm -hmm. $300 a month, even $200 a month, times 12 months, times 20 years, that's a lot of money. Right, and okay. that's a great message for the young people out there and also people in their 40s and 50s who are thinking, you know, this is my time to have this great car, this is my time to buy the mansion, you know, maybe it's not. And think, uh, real think, estate is another issue. I think if you say yes to today, I want this today, mm -hmm. you're saying no to tomorrow. Mm -hmm. If you say no to today, you're going to say yes to tomorrow. Yes, and you still can have a quality of life. Absolutely. And that's more of where, if you're not at the higher incomes, that that might be some place that would be a no. better place for you. When you come to middle age and, and, and older, a lot of planning can be done to minimize your losses. Where do you put your money? How much is safe? How much is at risk? Are your legal documents, I'm also a lawyer, are they coordinated with your financial assets? As you, as you get older, you sometimes prepare what they call a durable power of attorney. And uh, if you were my spouse and I became ill, needed a stroke, and I couldn't get money out of my 401k, I'm giving you the right to do that. So they go get a lawyer, they prepare a power of attorney, which may be prepared by a nice elder law attorney that really knows the law. It may be prepared by a real estate lawyer that closes the house. Those are going to be very different documents. But they take the documents, they go home, they put it in the drawer, and now there's dust. They never submit it to the custodian that has the money at Fidelity or whatever the case may be. They have no idea whether that works. It's like taking a trip and you, you check the spare tire in your trunk, but you have no idea if there's any air in it. Yes. Some companies don't accept powers of attorney. Mm. So now you're going off to court to get a custodian, a, a conservator appointed, and you're going to go to court to find out if you can take out money from your, your husband's 401k to take care of him. Exactly. Judge may say yes, judge may say no. So the key is you want people to really handle their business and make sure that they can think of things ahead of time instead of trying to get organized on the back end. Would that be fair to say? When you're planning and there's no stress, there's no pressure, there's no crisis, you can take your time to do it correctly. Okay. If you're doing it from the payphone of a hospital, not good. Right. Well, I'm so glad that you were able to join us today, and this is great information, and I'll look forward to hearing more as we go through the spring, and you know that important time, tax time. Look. We'll get there. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Welcome to In Studio. We're back and I have some wonderful, phenomenal women in the studio with me. Can I get a yay? Yay! yay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We will get it together. But uh, this is fantastic. There's so much happening with women these days. And we could just look back in the past few months and we could think ahead in the next few months and just tell me, I'll start off with Ellen, tell me uh, a moment you want us to think about. So actually today, the Women's Fund of Western Massachusetts announced a pilot partnership with the Mass Mutual to launch a young women's initiative to focus on economic prosperity, leadership empowerment, job training for young women ages 12 to 24. So we'll be able to work very closely with the students to identify with them, by them, and for them um, barriers that they're facing to the job training world, to the economic force field that runs our lives. And 
work with them to not only address those barriers, but find long-term solutions. And we're proud to have Mass Mutual as a partner with the Women's Fund to launch that pilot work. And this is fantastic because our women really need it, wouldn't you say? Yeah, is there absolutely. a statistic that you can think of that really will highlight the fact that women need resources? Sure. So working backwards through grant making, we find that at least a quarter of young women ages 12 to 24 either don't pursue higher education or if they do, um, often don't enter the field that they have studied. So finding a way for those women to enter their passions, study their passions, and then pursue them long term um, in a secure and stable uh, employment environment is really key to advancing women's economic empowerment. Oh yes, yes. And I'm just going to break from tradition for a moment, but have you all seen Hidden Figures? <laughs> if you haven't seen Hidden Figures, I think you have seen it. I, I, I'm not sure who's seen it. I'm but going on Friday. Yes, I but, hear it's um, supposed to be I great. I hear all of this, and when you see that movie, you, it really will say to you, thank God we are supporting every person with their vision. Yeah. <laughs> Just had to clear my throat. Thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> and how about you, Elizabeth? moment we need to think about? Yeah, um, so I was fortunate enough to um, participate in the Women's March. I'm so sorry. That's okay. <laughs> and March 8th, and um, it was really uh, emotional. It was uplifting, and I think it was just one of the greatest days of my life. Um, and so after participating in this momentous you know, March and um, coming home, I've given thought to, you know, some things that I would like to get involved in, in terms of supporting women, mentoring women, and creating opportunities for networks. And I am also on the advisory board for the Women's Fund, um, a, a great organization. But um, through my work and also through my um, activities in the community, um, I think sometimes we just have to sort of step back and think about what would be most impactful in terms of our time. And for me right now, it's really focusing on learning more about what's on, what's on uh, the radar and then what I can do personally to, um, to create those opportunities uh, to develop women and to support them and to also um, have a forum or a space where women can come together and really share ideas, best practices, and so that's where I'm putting all my energy right now. Which is great. And what is so needed for you? Um, I know there's a statistic that shows that um, women across the board are just not on boards um, across this country. Um, that may be a place. What other statistics that it really highlighted for you? Maybe, you know, the fact is that many women don't make as much as men. What, what's any issue that for you is important? Well, I think for me it's leadership development. Um, and not, not necessarily, while it's important also to um, have women in boards, it's also very important to provide opportunities for women to know other women um, that they want to aspire. So providing that space for women just to gather and, and to meet each other and to know where they're at. Um, and then also learning about, you know, what's in my community in terms of opportunities for me to engage, yes. um, you know, it could be that you know you might just have a uh, uh, one day that you can go in and just support a one day project, but um, having that knowledge and opportunities to um, to meet other uh, you know leaders in the community will you know f facilitate that. So I'm hof hopefully looking forward to creating those kinds of um, events um, for us to be able to get to know each other and to understand what, what is pressing in our community right now. Yes, yes, some of the emerging needs and hopefully finding solutions. How about you, Rachel? Um, I definitely have to second Elizabeth that I was uh, able to participate in the Women's March on Washington as well, and uh, the camaraderie and the sisterhood that came out of that has really set a fire in our nation that just will not go out. Uh, the Women's March didn't just stop at the Women's March. They're marching for immigrant rights. Uh, they're marching against the Muslim ban. Like, this is continuing, and it's run by women. And, like, this is fantastic. 
Also, I want to build off of Elizabeth talking about events where women can get together and meet each other. Um, I'm actually really looking forward at Bay Path University on March 8th. We're having an on the move forum and it's open to everyone and we'll be getting together. It's sort of a homage to the 1977 Women's Conference and sort of uh, bringing you know, that, that back to life and also adding this momentum of the Women's March and the Women's Movement. And, having wonderful dialogues. So yeah, that's really gonna be you know wonderful. And this is also one of the ways that all of us will work together, um, all being present, all being able to add our voices, have conversations as they did in 1977 to say, well, what do we wanna do about business? What do we wanna do about education? And people of all backgrounds can sit at these topic tables. So that's the other piece. It's, it's like no barriers, no lines. So we go from students to could be CEOs. Let's have a great conversation. And it's also continuing the work. It's also continuing this excitement. So for each of you, tell me, um, as we look forward, what's the most important thing that we can do to going forward that will continue to unite us and also keep us focused on the work to be done? So I think the march was a great kickoff, but certainly realizing that not only did the work not start on January 21st, but it doesn't end there either. So by working together in community coalitions, in partnerships, um, we can really truly advance the mission and, and have all boats rise. So by continuing to sort of operate in silos, if we don't communicate with each other, we are only serving to exacerbate the problems. So I suggest we not only communicate and collaborate openly, but we do it with an empathetic lens that will really allow us to see and hear where the other is coming from, see and identify what the needs are and how we can work together to really make impact, to make change right here in Western Mass. I think that's brilliant. And I, I also feel very strongly uh, about the same way that Ellen feels about us trying to listen to others a little bit more. Um, I, I think that you know what's going on in this country and also the issues that are so important to all of us requires us to take a step back and to have empathy and to really listen. Um, I went to a conference uh, last fall and the takeaway that I got from it was that we should listen to each other as if we were defending what the other person had to say. And oftentimes when someone is speaking, you're already trying to respond, right? And these times require us to really think and to um, listen to each other um, because I think that is going to create understanding and at many and and oftentimes healing um, if we just you know practice that. And so I'm hoping that um, we can begin to have opportunities you know where we can get to know each other a little bit better and to understand each other. Yes, and that is so true. How about you, Rachel, things that we can do? Yes, um, I definitely think that we could um, keep an open mind to what it means to be a woman. Um, and uh, in like going off of like getting to know each other, like opening up the idea that there are many people with many identities. Um, I'm very passionate about adding trans women into the conversation of women because this is a group of people being excluded. So sort of, you know, taking the work that we've done already to define what it means to be a woman and then taking it further and having it change as often and as much as we are changing. Yeah, and I think that's so important for all of us to really take that station break. And when we think back, and you guys can't think back, but I'll think back. I mean, <laughs> too, when you look at the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, what decade for you really um, comes alive when it, it comes to really not only addressing the issues, but just feeling alive and present? So as a child of the digital age, I certainly have to honor <laughs> those that have come before me. Um, you were talking about the event coming up, and here we are 40 years later. So this March in 1977, we're in 2017, still having these conversations about these issues. So sort of acknowledging not only the history that's come before us, the hard work, the legwork, the, the marchers that made it happen for us to march again now, um, but recognizing that the conversation isn't done. Right. So what next do we still have to do to be inclusive of you know rights and, and equal empowerment? So working together in a way that honors what's come before but allows us to organize and prepare for the journey ahead. Yes, and I think it was so brave of, um, I think, of the movement, whether it was the um, social movements mm. of the 60s and 70s and 
King and, you know, all of the greats who have come before to really say we have a voice. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's great to really reflect back and to really honor some of those women. Do you all have women in your lives that you would like just to give a shout out of a woman who either you know or you don't know that made a difference? And I'm going to give a shout out to, um, and I'm going to go far with this, but it's my mother-in-law in Mississippi. My husband's in studio today and I just want him to know and the world to know uh, extremely strong woman of great character who nurtured a family of seven boys and a daughter and in the middle of Mississippi from 50s on up that was a lot to do so that's who I pay homage to today. Oh I would say my mother as well um, who truly gave me a political lens a great foot up and taught me that I can do anything I set my mind to. Yes. I will not uh, specifically um, just one woman because I have so many mm. but I think um, each and every one of them has uh, given me a gift, a gift of self-confidence, a gift of uh, understanding who I am and, and speaking to me in terms of my skills and talents and making sure that um, I don't forget my roots. And also, um, many of them have challenged me um, in order to become the woman that I am today. And so in my own <clears throat> Whenever I have an opportunity to mentor, I take a little bit of, you know, my mother, my grandmother, and mentors that I've had, um, and what they've taught me, um, and I've passed it along because I feel that, you know, those lessons are so valuable, and I want to make sure that, you know, other individuals um, have the opportunity to see themselves for who they are and have the confidence to act upon, you know, who they are and be their true selves. Exactly. Well, I definitely agree that trying to pinpoint just one woman <laughs> is rather difficult, but um, I would have to send a shout out to my grandma Patsy, all the way in Alabama, mm -hmm. who is the hardest, dilig most diligent worker I know. Uh, she's a love. Good. Well, I am so inspired by all of you and all of the women you represent all the women that you mentor, all of the women that you pull into the circle. And that is so important. And we all have to be there for each other and extend ourselves across the community. So I just want to thank you for being here today. And the one word that keeps coming to me is authentic. And I really thank you for being your authentic selves. And if we could bring that to March 8th and all the other events, we'll be doing really good. So thank you so much thank for, you, for being thank in you. the studio.